Welcome, my crafty friends, to another What the Craft bootorial. Ah, ah, ah. Today's project is this bewitching bat skirt. I love how the layers of the tool give the impression of the bats fluttering in midair. If this goth Halloween queen aesthetic isn't your thing, you could do a red skirt with little hearts all over it, or a white skirt with snowflakes, flowers, smiley faces. You know what I always say, get wacky. But that's enough chit chat. Let's get it on. Now, tool can be kind of a pain to work with, but I've got a few tips to make your life easier. The first is that tool can be a bit staticky and has a tendency to kind of stick to itself. One way to combat that is to keep a dryer sheet handy and give the layers of tool a quick rub down if you start having static issues. Also, because of the staticiness, store your tool in a bag or a container or something that is away from dust and lint and stray threads. It attracts that stuff like Velcro, and that is especially a no-no with black. The second thing about tool is that when it comes straight off the bolt, it often has some wrinkles and crinkles. I've heard people say you can't iron tool, but that's just not true. Tool is generally made from nylon, and my iron actually has a nylon setting. Keep it on that setting, and you should be good to go. You can also use a press cloth, a washcloth in my case, if you're uncomfortable with the idea of putting your hot iron directly on the tool, Though I assure you, if your iron is on the correct temperature setting, it shouldn't be a problem. Alternately, if you have a garment steamer, that works quite well to straighten out tool as well. I've even heard it suggested that you can hang your tool skirt in the bathroom while you take a hot shower and the steam from that should relax any wrinkles. Lastly, let's talk about sewing seams on tool. Because it's so thin and mesh-like, it can sometimes get sucked right down into your machine. There are a few things you can do to prevent this. One is to use a jersey or stretch needle. The ballpoint end of the needle is more blunt than the needle for woven fabrics and should slip more easily into those mesh holes versus snagging on the fibers themselves. The other thing you can do is start an inch or so down the seam line versus right at the edge of the fabric. Then you can just backstitch back to the edge before continuing on down the seam. The other issue you might come across when seaming your tool is that it has a tendency to pucker it will almost gather itself while you sew. This can make it so your side seams end up several inches shorter than the rest of your skirt, and we do not want that. I think what's happening here is that the mesh of the tool is getting snagged and pulled by the feed dogs, which leads to the puckering. Here's how to prevent this. First, check your sewing machine manual to see if you can change the amount of presser foot tension. Mine has this little doohickey on the top of the machine here that I can release all the way for minimum tension or push all the way down for maximum tension, or I can put it somewhere in the middle. I found that the minimum tension works best for tool. Some machines might have a screw on top instead of a button like this, and if you have a fancy digital machine, my guess is there's some way to control this as well. Another thing we can do to help the puckering issue is to use a smaller stitch length. The other thing that really helps is to keep tension on the seam while you sew by gently stretching the fabric, which should prevent the tool from bunching up. Lastly, if you try all of these things and they don't help, or especially if your machine won't let you control the presser foot tension, you can lay a piece of tissue paper or tearaway stabilizer underneath the tool while you sew. This will keep the feed dogs away from the tool altogether and you should have zero puckering. When you're done sewing, just gently tear away the paper. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of what the seam looks like when I've done everything right versus everything wrong. Now that we're ready to tackle this tool, let's get started. The things you will need for this skirt are lining fabric. I am using Trico, which is basically your garden variety spandex. I think it works especially great for this skirt because it's heavy enough to resist any of the static cling issues that are common with tulle, and it doesn't have to be hemmed. Whatever you choose, I'd suggest a knit fabric so you don't have to hem, and also because having some stretch will make it easier to get on and off. We also need tulle and lots of it. You will need waistband elastic. I am using a two inch elastic, and you'll need your natural waist measurement to determine the length needed. For the bats, we want glitter felt. I ended up using one and a quarter sheets that measured 12 by 19 inches each. If you can't find glitter felt, you could look for glitter craft foam, and you could also use plain felt. Regardless of what you choose for the bats, you'll also want some plain felt in a color that matches the cutouts. You'll need a hot glue gun, some safety pins, and two free templates from my website the circle skirt template, and the bat template. Okay, let's figure out how much lining fabric we'll need. There are three measurements you'll wanna take before you start. Your natural waist measurement, your hip measurement, and the length you want the skirt to be. I'll use myself as an example. 
my hip measurement is 42 inches. That's the measurement I will use for the circumference of my lining. Next, take your skirt length measurement and subtract the width of your elastic. I'm aiming for a skirt that is 26 inches long, so I subtract two inches and get 24 inches. Now we're going to calculate what I call the cutting length, which is a term I totally made up for this tutorial, but it's going to help determine how much fabric you'll need, so hang in there with me. We're going to add the radius of the hip circumference to the length minus the waistband width, and I know that sounds scary because geometry, but it's really simple actually. You can either use the circle skirt template, measuring from the corner of the template to your hip circumference number to get the radius, or you can do math, and it's really simple math. Take your hip measurement and divide it by 6.28. Boom, done. So for me, that is 6.7 inches plus 24 inches for my length, and that gives me 30.7, and I'm just gonna round that up to 31 inches to make things easier. So now we have our cutting length. Write this number down somewhere because we'll need it later. Take the cutting length and multiply it by two. If that number is less than or equal to the width of your fabric, you can cut your fabric in one piece. Yay, no seams. Divide your cutting length times two number by 36 to get the yardage. It probably won't be a whole number, so round up to the next half yard. Okay, if you're like me and your fabric isn't quite wide enough to cut in one piece, then we have to cut our lining in two pieces. Boo, hiss. Take your cutting length and multiply it by four. Then divide that number by 36 to get the yardage. So in my case, I take 31 inches times four, which gives me 124. To convert that to yards, I divide it by 36 and I get 3.4. So I'll need about three and a half yards of lining fabric. Now, the measurements for our tool are gonna to be a little bit different. And that is because in addition to cutting the tool into a circle skirt, we are also going to make a larger circle so we can gather it for more volume. Take your natural waist measurement and multiply it by two. That's gonna be the circumference for the tool portion of the skirt. In my case, my waist is 30 inches, so my circumference is 60. To get the cutting length, measure the appropriate length on the circle skirt template or divide your circumference by 6.28. Add this to your tool length, which is the length of your skirt minus one inch. Now remember for the lining, we subtracted two inches, but we want to ensure the tool will be longer than the lining. So in my case, we get 9.5 inches plus 25 inches, which results in a total cutting length of 34.5 inches. Again, write this number down for when it comes time to actually cut. You can probably guess what we do next. If you guess that we multiply the cutting length times two and then compare that to our tool width, ding, 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 we have a winner. If your number is less than or equal to the width of your tool, you can cut your tool in one piece. Whee! Divide the number by 36 to get your yardage for one layer. That's important because I'm going to suggest at least two layers of tool. I'm using four layers. You can do more or less as you see fit, but again, I would suggest using at least two layers of tool. So remember to multiply the single layer yardage by the number of layers you want. Using my numbers as an example, I multiply my cutting length by two, and that gives me 69 inches. Divide that by 36 to get 1.9 yards. If I want two layers of tool, I multiply that by two and get 3.8 yards. If I want four layers of tool, I multiply it by four and get 7.6 yards. Seven plus yards probably sounds like a lot, but keep in mind that tool is usually very cheap, like a dollar a yard or less. I got a 40 yard bolt on Etsy for $12. That's like 30 cents a yard, my dudes. All right, if you're a poor sap like me and your tool isn't wide enough to cut in one piece, proceed to the next step. Just like we did last time with our lining, we're going to take our cutting length and multiply it by four. For me, that's 138 inches divided by 36, that's 3.8 yards. Again, this is the yardage for a single layer, so multiply that yardage by the number of layers you want. I'm doing four layers, which means I need 15.2 yards of tool. But now that we know how cheap tool is, we're not even freaking out, right? Right. And with that, we can all breathe a sigh of relief because we are officially done with the math stuff. <sighs> if you're using the circle skirt template, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just find your measurement and cut. I'm going to start by cutting and assembling my lining first. Here is my lining fabric. I've got kind of a raggedy cut edge here, so I'm going to move in an inch or two and mark that off with a pin, and I'll measure from that point instead of the actual edge. I'm going to take my cutting length now from earlier, which was 31 inches for my lining, and I'm going to mark that out on the selvage. 
This is where I will fold my fabric. I'm trying to do this on my cutting table, which is kind of a pain because my fabric is too wide and keeps wanting to slip off the edge. So if you have a big, nice open space on the floor somewhere, you can cut there and make your life easier. I'm gonna use some pattern weights to hold my fabric in place once I get it folded and all laying nice and flat. Now I'll take my template, cut to the correct size, and I'll align it with the folded edge. And since I'm cutting the skirt in two pieces, I'm gonna leave a gap here for the seam allowance. I'm just gonna use these selvage lines on the fabric to mark that out for me, but you can use a standard width like half an inch if you're more comfortable with that. And now it's time to mark. Black fabric is kind of a pain to mark, so I've got a handy dandy Choco liner, which basically spits out a tiny bit of chalk dust when I roll it over the fabric. And the chalk comes out super easily, so I really love this little guy. Now it's time to mark our length. For that, we will use our cutting length number again. Measure out the cutting length from the corner of the template, not the corner of the fabric, since the seam allowance would throw things off. My cutting length is 31 inches, so I measure out 31 inches right at the edge, and then a little more into the fabric, and then a little more into the fabric, adjusting the angle of my measuring tape little by little each time, until I have a sort of connect the dots version of my length measured out from the selvage over to the folded edge. Now, to keep my fabric from slipping and sliding while I cut, I'm going to pin along the selvage for a bit more stability. I could have done this before measuring. That actually would have been smart, frankly, but whatever. Now we get to play connect the dots. Once you've got your dots connected, it's time to cut. Here we are with the length cut, and now we'll cut out the waist. Note that I've pinned around the waist marks. That's because once I'm done cutting, I'm going to carefully fold this up and set it aside, and then I will use it as a template for the other half of the skirt, and that way I won't have to measure out the length a second time. With our first half cut, it's time to do that whole thing again. So here's my fabric, folded in half again. And here is the skirt half I just cut out. Now all we have to do is line up the fold on one side and the selvages on the other, like so. And then we can trace around the hem of the first half. Viola! Time to cut! Whee! Now you might have noticed that I haven't traced the waist marking, and that is because the paper template is probably going to be more accurate than the skirt, so I'm going to pop that on there and trace around it again. You know the drill by now. Cutting time! Now we have two lining pieces ready to pin and sew together. So I'll just lay these right sides together, lining up the edges and pinning along the seam allowances. Ugh, sorry about the focus issues. My camera really hates all this black fabric. If you happen to end up with one edge that's a little longer than the other side, like I've got right here, just even it up with your scissors or my favorite, the rotary cutter. Once you have both edges pinned together, it's time to sew. Here we are all sewed up. I've used some white threads. You can actually see the stitching. You'll obviously want to use a thread color that matches your fabric a bit better. Now we can trim up those seam allowances, and if you'd like, you can press the seams as well. But I'm not going to when you can't make me. With our lining stitched up, we can move on to the tool. Since my tool came on a bolt, it is folded in half, the wrong way, which means I'm going to have to cut off the length I need before I can start. Here I've marked one end. Pins don't work so well on tool. They have a tendency to fall out and get snagged in the mesh, so I am using Wonder Clips. A safety pin would work just as well. Going back to my tool cutting length number from when we did all that math before, I will measure out 34.5 inches, then I'll place another marker 34.5 inches from that one. So now I've measured out a total of 69 inches. Now I'll use my rotary cutter and my cutting mat to cut a straight line all the way up the tool. Here I've taped my template back together so I can reuse it. I'm using double my waist measurement, which is 60 inches, so I find 60 inches on the template and cut. Once I have my length of tool cut out, I have to unfold it and then fold it back the right way. So here we are all folded up. And now we place our template just like before, snugged up against the fold on one side and leaving a gap for the seam allowance on the selvage side. Now I'm gonna clip this in place so it'll stay put while I work. Marking tool is a major pain. So instead of marking it all, I'm just gonna cut as I go. If you'd prefer, you could mark the tool with small pieces of masking tape or safety pins before cutting but I'm just going for it. I'll just anchor my measuring tape to the corner with a clip, and then I will use a pattern weight to hold the tape in place while I cut, moving all the way around the tool just like I did with the lining. Once the length is cut, it's time to cut out the waist. Easy peasy. Now, if you want to try to use this piece of tool as a guide the way we did with the lining, go for it. 
but tulle is such a sticky, staticky pain in the ass, I'm not going to bother. I'm going to cut out each piece of tulle the old-fashioned way. And since I'm doing four layers, that means I need eight of these. One down, seven to go. I'll see you in a week. Uh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, let's skip ahead. Take two of your tulle layers and slap them together. My tulle doesn't really have a right side and wrong side, so anything goes. Just line up the edges and use clips or safety pins to keep things together. Again, if you have any uneven hems, just even those up before sewing. Using the tips from the beginning of the video, stitch together your two tulle halves. Here's mine. And again, I will note that I've only used white thread so you can see the stitching. Always match your thread to your fabric. Repeat for each tool layer. Once you've got all your tool pieces stitched up, it's time to bring our lining back out. As you can see, I have quarter marked the waist of the lining, which just means I've divided it into four equal parts. And then we will do the same with one of our tool layers. Remember I said we'll be gathering the tool? So we're on a quick line of basting stitches about one quarter inch from the edge of the waist. Leave one end of the stitching open, only backstitching at the other end. Then grab the thread tails from the open end and give a little tug, which should start to form gathers. Now we'll line this tool layer up with our lining layer. I'm laying the wrong side of the tool, that would be the side with the seams now, on the right side of the lining. Line up the quarter marks of each layer, and then adjust the gathers as necessary so that the waist hole on the tool layer matches the waist hole on the lining layer. I just need to snug this up a little bit. Once everything is laying nicely and the gathers are evenly distributed, we can start to pin the tool to the lining. And once that first layer of tool is pinned down, we can do the same thing with the second layer of tool. You might be wondering right now why I didn't just baste my four tool layers together and gather them all at once, and I could do that. But doing it this way will yield a fuller skirt because we'll have the gathers of each layer fluffing the layers above it. And I think that extra fullness is worth it. It's the whole point of a tool skirt after all. Okay, so now I've got all four layers of tool pinned in place. Time to baste them all together. You could actually baste these to the lining one at a time as you go, if you want, but I'm being lazy. Once you've got the skirt basted together, we will move over to our waistband elastic. My waist is 30 inches, so I've cut my elastic at 29 inches. With a half inch seam allowance on either side, that will make the end result 28 inches, which is two inches smaller than my waist. I'd suggest you pin your elastic around your waist to find the right snugness. Not all elastic is created equal, and if you have a stretchier elastic, you might find you want it cinched a little bit tighter. Now we'll stitch the waistband together. I like to start with a straight stitch, then I'll press the seam open and do a zigzag stitch down the middle of the seam and also down each raw edge and that will make sure everything stays right where it should. Oh, and yours will look so much better because you used thread that matches your elastic. Time to quarter mark our elastic. Then we will match that up to the quarter marks on our skirt. Make sure the seam on the elastic gets lined up with the back of the skirt and the sides with the side seams you get the drill. And this time around, we are attaching the skirt and the elastic right sides together. Remember that our skirt waist is cut to our hip measurement, so we can actually get the skirt on, and the elastic is cut to our waist measurement, so there's probably a bit of extra skirt hanging out between those quarter marks. That's fine. By stretching the elastic, we'll fit all that extra fabric in there, no problem. We just need to pin all this business into place. What I like to do is take the center point of the elastic and the center point of the skirt and pin those together. Then I'll do that again on each side. Just like with the quarter marking, this ensures that all that extra skirt fabric will be evenly eased into the waistband. Repeat this pinning process around the whole waistband, and now we're ready to sew. You'll want to use a zigzag stitch for this. I've got the elastic on bottom while I'm sewing and the skirt on top. The trick here is to grab onto the elastic with one hand behind the machine and one hand in front of the machine and stretch the elastic out until the skirt portion is laying flat. And then with the elastic still stretched, we begin to sew. You'll probably only be able to do this a few inches at a time. And if you've never done this before, it'll probably feel kind of awkward to try to stretch and guide the fabric through the machine at the same time. Just go slow and you'll get the hang of it. When you stop sewing and readjust your grip on the elastic, you might find it's easier to stop with the needle in the down position, as this will keep the fabric from shifting out from under the presser foot. I've had enough practice that I can usually skip that step. Sew all the way around the skirt this way, back stitching when you get to where you started. I've stitched pretty close to the edge here, maybe a quarter inch from the edge. 
Since we have so many froofy layers of tulle, I like to stitch another row, more like half an inch from the edge, just to make sure I've got all those layers secure. The second row of stitching is done the same way as the first, stretching the elastic as you go. Woo, the skirt portion is almost done. But first, we have to address the hem. Circle skirts hems stretch out over time, it's just what they do. So if you have the time, you'll want to hang your skirt for a few days. The tool probably won't move much because it's so light, but the lining almost definitely will. Here's my skirt on a dress form, and you can see we've got some sections that look okay. We've also got some areas near the sides of the skirt especially that are very clearly longer than the tool, even though we cut the lining shorter than the tool. That's pretty much what I expected. So I'm going to take some pins and mark a line around the lining that is approximately one inch shorter than the tool. I mentioned before that I'm not going to hem my lining. I'm just going to leave the edges raw since this fabric doesn't fray. If you're a hemming nut and are dead set on hemming your lining, mark it more like half an inch shorter than the tool instead of one inch so you have a bit of hem allowance to work with. And if you don't have a dress form, you can either put the skirt on someone or put it on a hanger to do this. Once you've got a good number of pins marking the correct hem length, you can lay it out, pushing all the tool layers up toward the waistband so we have just the lining exposed. Here you can see we've got another connect the dots type situation with my pins. I'm just going to take my handy Chaco liner and mark where the pins are. Once I take those out, it's just a matter of connecting the dots. You could mark your entire skirt up before you start cutting, but since this chalk comes out so easily, I'm going to cut as I go. I really love a rotary cutter for this because I can get a perfectly smooth line with none of those jagged edges you sometimes get with scissors. Once I've finished with one section, I will move on to the next until I've gone around the whole hem. And here you can see how some sections I had to take off maybe an inch, and other sections I had to take off almost three inches. So don't be alarmed if it seems like some areas of your hem need a bigger haircut than others. Now, in trimming the hem, you probably also trimmed off the back stitching at the very end of your lining seams, and the last thing we want is for the lining to start coming unstitched. So all we have to do is put a quick bar tack at the bottom of each side seam. And a bar tack is nothing more than a very small bit of back stitching. You can also use a stationary zigzag stitch. I'll just pop this thing back on the dress form and yeah, that's much better. No bits of lining poking out from underneath anymore. Are you guys ready for this? It's bat time. Here's my sheet of glitter felt and here is my bat template all cut out. I'm going to trace this onto the back of the felt. I'm worried about the chocolate liner getting smudged and just not working well in the felt, so I'm going to use a white gel pen. Yep, just a plain old gel pen. This should only be used in places that won't be visible like the back side of this felt, because I have no idea if it washes out. Here's my traced bat, and now it's time to cut it out. Pretty simple. Except that now we need, oh, about 50 of these. I actually ended up using 55 bats. You might need more or less depending on your size and your placement. To give you some idea of how many bats you'll need, hang up your skirt and use safety pins or clips to mark where you want the bats to go. I'm going for fairly even placement across and down the skirt almost like polka dots, if you will. But you could do different patterns. Maybe you just want a row of bats going around the hem. You do you, my dude. Try to pin or clip just the top layer of tulle. I marked up the front half of my skirt, counted up the clips and pins, and multiplied that by two to figure out roughly how many bats I'd need, plus a few extra just to be safe. You know what they say, the more bats, the merrier. You can also mark up the whole skirt to get the exact number, but I ran out of clips, so it was just easier to do it in halves. Either way you do it, leave the pins and clips in place for the next step. Behold my pile of bats, ready for placement. While my glue gun heats up, I'm going to use a hair tie to wrangle all the layers of my skirt together, except the top layer of tulle. This will make my life much easier in the next step. If you don't have a hair tie, you can tie a piece of ribbon or elastic around it instead. Okay, here's my top layer of tulle all separated out. And here's my handy little silicone glue gun mat, which is one of my very best friends. I'm going to take a small square of the plain black felt and lay that on my mat. Then I'm going to put a dab of glue on it. Now I will find one of my markers. That spot goes over the dab of glue. And finally, one of my bats goes on top. We're basically sandwiching the tool between the two pieces of felt. Press this into place and let it cool before moving on to the next marker. If you find any of those webby glue strings after it's cooled, go ahead and take those off now. It's easier to do it now rather than later. Now, I know hot glue has somewhat of a reputation for being kind of a cheat. If you would prefer to not use hot glue, you can sew the bats to the skirt. Here's a sample I did with some scraps of my felt in vaguely bat-like shapes. 
here's my glued guy, and here's the sewn guy. Just backstitch back and forth a few times, and he's not going anywhere. And if you use black thread, it will be pretty much invisible. But hot glue is faster, so that's what I'm going with. Make sure that while you're working, you don't touch that metal nozzle of the glue gun to the tool anywhere. It might be hot enough to melt the nylon. Once I finish the first half of the skirt, I do the same for the second half. Marking and marking and then gluing and gluing. Until finally, I'm done. Holy bat balls. We did it. We're done. Like, actually done. And now we have this bat-tastic Halloween skirt. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss my next tutorial. Leave a comment below and let me know how your project turned out. And be sure to visit whatthecraft.com for more crafty tips, tutorials, and kick-ass sewing patterns. Oh, and happy Halloween!